Hey, Rex, look at that light in the sky. What's that? I'm worried, Rex. I think it's an asteroid. An asteroid? What's that? It's a giant rock from space. Look, if it hits Earth, it could wipe us all out. Huh, you're being ridiculous. Asteroids aren't real. Next thing you know, you'll try to tell me the Earth isn't flat. But I saw it, Rex. It's huge. Okay, okay. Just calm down. I'm sure it's nothing. I hope you're right. Oh my god. Designing Dinosaurs with Stephanie Warren Drimmer. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. Now this week we look at designing dinosaurs. Now how do we know details about dinosaurs that are not readily apparent from the fossil record? Uh, how can we tell what we can tell about the colors, sounds, and behaviors of these magnificent little beasties? Later in the show, we're going to talk with Stephanie Warren Drimmer from National Geographic about her new book, Jurassic Smarts. Now, fossils, including those of dinosaurs, have been known about since ancient times. These findings led to legends of dragons, cyclopses, and at least one odd guess at giant humans. Uh, fossils tell us a lot about ancient life, including those of dinosaurs. I mean, a two meter long thigh bone couldn't possibly fit inside a chicken sized dinosaur. Am I right? I mean, seriously, how would they walk? But how do we know what dinosaurs look like or how they behaved? The answer lies in the incredible work of paleontologists and the deeper clues they uncover from these ancient snapshots of life forms. Now, fossils are basically nature's time capsules. They preserve records of ancient life, including dinosaurs. Most dinosaur fossils are bones and teeth and and sometimes you get lucky and find skin impressions or even patterns of feathers. These provide valuable information about a dinosaur's physical appearance. Just four decades ago, dinosaurs were nearly universally believed to be overgrown lizards covered in scales. In the 1990s, the discovery of fossilized Feather imprints on certain dinosaur species led scientists to conclude that some dinosaurs had feathers in the place of at least some of their scales. It is possible primitive feathers may have served as thermal insulation before becoming instruments of flight. Now, some paleontologists now propose that all dinosaurs may have had at least some feathers, although not all species were covered in, in these bird-like structures. This was a game-changing revelation in our understanding of how dinosaurs looked. But what about color? Now, this is where things get really interesting. Uh, features of melanin-containing organelles, uh, called melanosomes, can be preserved in fossils. Study of these tiny structures can reveal the colors of the creature. Uh, some dinosaurs may have even been rainbow-colored, or... Oh, oh no. No, not that. Dinosaurs roam for years galore, one-sixth of a million, maybe more. Dinosaurs big, dinosaurs small, some could fly and some could crawl. Humans are just a tiny speck in time's grand scheme, just a fleck. 300,000 years up to today, but will you make it till next Thursday? To add a little color to our discussion of designing dinosaurs, we welcome Stephanie Warren Drimmer from National Geographic, author of Jurassic Smarts, back to the show. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. 
Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on the Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined once again by Stephanie Warren Drimmer. She is a Natchio kid, she's an author, an editor, an all-around cool educational person. She has a new book, Jurassic Smarts, out from uh, Natchio Kids, and we're going to talk some about dinosaurs. Welcome back to the show, Stephanie. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Let's talk dinos. Let's talk dinos. Okay, so we know there's a gajillion answers to this, but let's pick a few. What makes dinosaurs so cool? That's a really good question. And um, one that I thought a lot about when I was writing this book, because I think dinosaurs can sort of feel like, I've uh, been there, done that. We know what's about. We know what they're about, you know. Um, but it's really not true. And in fact, we are living in a golden age of dinosaur discovery right now. So right now, um, there is a new species of dinosaur discovered about once every two weeks. Um, that is just an incredible pace of scientific research. And, um, you know, we have all kinds of new technology, too, that is uncovering new stuff about dinosaurs. Uh, I learned while working on this book that Basically, everything that I learned about dinosaurs when I was a kid was totally wrong. Right. And if you pick up this book and flip through it, you'll see that even just by a glance, you can tell looking at these dinosaurs, they look very different than what you thought dinosaurs looked like. Mm. So what are some of your, new, your favorite new discoveries about dinosaurs? Um, so, uh, you know, Looking, being able to shake up what we thought dinosaurs looked like is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, we are able to use electron microscopes to peer into fossilized pigments and see what color dinosaurs actually were. Um, you know, in textbooks, when I was a kid, dinosaurs were always depicted as kind of boring earth shades, like all brown and green. Um, that was totally wrong. They, I'm thinking of a dinosaur named Incornus huxleyi. Um, this was a flying feather dinosaur that had black and white wings and a bright red sort of mohawk on top of its head. Um, <laughs> I pity totally the fool that has to, that has to mess with that bird. <laughs> 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 That's right. Yeah, it was not one of the most ferocious dinosaurs, but it was <laughs> certainly one of the most striking looking. Um, and, you know, totally different than what I thought dinosaurs looked like when I was a kid. Mm, mm. And so what do you think are some of people's biggest misconceptions about these adorable little creatures? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, like I said, pretty much everything. So... Dinosaurs, we now know uh, many of them, if not most of them, were feathered. And that includes the theropods, the two legged dinosaurs. So that would be like your T Rex, perhaps, or T Rex relatives. Many theropods were feathered. Um, like I said, they were colorful. And uh, perhaps that is because, you know, scientists have wondered. Well, how, how do feathers evolve? That's a really interesting question because you don't go from a lumbering four-legged reptile to all of a sudden you have feathers and you're flying. There are a lot of steps in between. So what would cause feathers to evolve? You know, maybe it was for warmth is one theory. Um, but a big theory that's gaining a lot of traction is that dinosaurs had feathers for mating displays. And um, there are actually, uh, there's actually fossilized evidence that dinosaurs did engage in mating dances. Some of them, there are some fossilized, what they call dinosaur dance floors, where you can see where trackways and tail patterns were made and carved into the ground over and over by dinosaurs dancing in like the same spot all the time, which is 
seems really strange, but we know, you know, everyone has seen those nature videos of modern birds shaking their tail feathers, flapping their wings, showing off their head plumes. And we know, we now know that birds are dinosaurs. And so it's not surprising that dinosaurs would have done the same thing. Yeah, so the dinosaurs had feathers. Um, we are, we think of them as um, sort of dim-witted animals, right? Uh, well, now we know that many dinosaurs cared for their young. You know, we had this perception that they, they sort of laid eggs and left. And um, that's not true. We have discovered that some species of dinosaurs lived in these enormous colonies of perhaps hundreds of parent dinosaurs caring for um, their eggs. And because there are also fossilized juvenile dinosaurs in these same sites, um, we can conclude that they may have cared for young dinosaurs as well. Um, so dinosaurs being caring parents, you know, that's uh, having kind of a heart is not something we picture, but also it means that there was some kind of social structure for dinosaurs living in these big groups, caring for their young, maybe caring for each other's young. Um, you need serious brains to live in that kind of um, social hierarchy. Um, we, you know, were taught that dinosaurs were cold blooded and um, like reptiles could only have lived in the hottest areas. Well, a few years ago, uh, a fossilized feather from a dinosaur was discovered in Australia, which during the time that the dinosaur was alive, um, because Australia has moved over time, it was actually very close to Antarctica. It was mm. a polar region. Um, and that's just one of many dinosaurs that have been discovered in polar regions. So now we know that, you know, they were not necessarily cold-blooded. Um, they were able to live even in areas that may have gotten ice and snow. Um, yeah, so I mean, you name it, pretty much everything you thought you knew about dinosaurs was wrong, which of course makes it super fun to read about. Yeah, I, I, I just love that if you pair together the idea of them caring for each other's young with these dinosaur dance floors. That means that, you know, they might have just like gotten a babysitter for the night and headed out to the <laughs> dino disco. <laughs> yeah, maybe. So, so what got you started down this life of science and education and all that, all that nerdy stuff? Oh, well, it's cool to be a nerd now. So that's fortunate yeah. for me. Yeah. Um, when I was a kid, I was really interested in nature and loved being outside and wanted to know what every plant and tree and animal and bug was. Um, that has not diminished. I'm still that nerd. Um, now I can Google stuff on my phone. Like what kind of mushroom is this? Um, right. what kind of berry is this? What kind of bird made that call? I'm, I'm still, you know, a nerd that's interested in all of that stuff. Um, and uh, I love writing for kids. I think I have sort of a kid level curiosity about the world. Um, I love the weird and gross and cool, which are all things that kids love. And, um, you know, dinosaurs are just a great avenue for that. I mean, there's, there, if you're fascinated by science and nature, you are definitely fascinated by dinosaurs. They were just some of the coolest animals to ever live on our planet, some of the biggest, the most ferocious. Um, and, you know, they lived here for 160 million years. For much of that time, they were the dominant animals on our planet. Um, you know, it can kind of seem like, oh, the dinosaurs, they came and then they all got wiped out. You know, they weren't that important really, but 160 million years, Modern humans, we have only been around for about 200,000 years. So that means that dinosaurs lived 800 times longer than we have. And in that time, they truly conquered the planet. They lived in every corner of the land, you know? So I think that's something that makes dinosaurs really cool. If you walk your kid to the bus stop, if you, you know, walk outside, I don't work for a sandwich. Wherever you're going, there were dinosaurs that lived there, sharing our planet, uh, you know, totally different from the way we live here. And I think we can sort of think, oh, they were just a blip. But really, I mean, they were the blip. <laughs> they were powerful. When 160 million years old, your species becomes, do this well, you will not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... 
of course, you know, we, when, I think when a lot of people look at dinosaurs or think about dinosaurs, they think about these big, huge dinosaurs, you know, the Apatosaurus, the Tyrannosaurus, the, and the uh, violent ones. But a lot of them were really sort of small and herbivores and intelligent little things as well. And, Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, a lot of dinosaurs were small and scrappy. Um, and, you know, it's whenever people ask what's the biggest or smallest or, you know, any kind of superlative dinosaur, you have to caveat it by saying that, well, we're discovering two new species a month. So whatever you think the biggest or smallest dinosaur is, that title is going to be taken. Um, right. So, that, you know, you can't say for sure what was the, the most of anything right mm. now. But um, one of the smallest dinosaurs was Microraptor. Um, it was about the size of a crow, so between like one and three pounds, pretty light. Mm -hmm. um, and this was a feathered dinosaur. It was very like inky black in color, also like a crow. crow? <laughs> and it lived, uh, it lived sort of like a flying squirrel. It did not probably fly, but it would glide from treetop to treetop in the forest, um, hunting for things like lizards and small mammals. Um, but it did not glide on two wings. It actually had four wings, which wow. you don't have any like that alive today. So that's pretty cool. cool. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think? If let's say uh, dinosaurs had not got extinct and somehow humans evolved in the same sort of way, and so they're still around today, um, any of these dinosaurs going to make interesting house pets? Animal um, companions? Yeah, I think I think they could have. Um, in fact, I wrote about this for another dinosaur book that came out recently, which is called How to Survive in the Age of Dinosaurs. Mm. And um, I talked to some experts who, who posited that it would have been absolutely possible to train dinosaurs, which I think they do in the new Jurassic Park movie. Um, right. You know, it seems weird, but we talked about how birds are just a subset of dinosaurs and people train birds for falconry all the time. They've been doing it for thousands of years. And so it is not unreasonable to think that you might have been, you could perhaps, if you were able to go back in time or resurrect a dinosaur to now, that you could have trained it to maybe hunt for you or follow your commands. Um, probably not something like a T-Rex. I don't think no, that no. would be worth the risk. Um, <laughs> it's not the way I would have invested my money if uh, I had no. the money to Jurassic Park now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or, you know, might have been some dinosaurs that, you know, don't necessarily train, but they still hang around with us in a detente based on mutual benefit. Like, say, house cats. Yeah, maybe. They're not necessarily <laughs> trained. <laughs> no, my cat does whatever she wants. Um, but you know, you could also imagine um, that maybe you could observe some of the enormous plant-eating dinosaurs. They would have been something like uh, modern-day elephants. You know, people <laughs> travel to Africa, go on safari, and observe them. They're so big, they're not afraid of you. Um, and the enormous dinosaur, dinosaurs like Argentinosaurus, um, those kind of uh, plant eaters, they wouldn't have been scared of you. Uh, maybe if you travel back in dinosaur times, you could have gone on safari to watch them doing their thing. That's also fun to think about. That's so cool. And so who do you, what do you think is, are some of the most overlooked uh dinosaurs like what are some of the cool dinosaurs that people really should know about and don't there are so many i mean most people only know a handful of dinosaurs you know and um there a lot of those are cool for a reason i would have to say uh, my favorite dinosaur after writing all of this is um t-rex i mean i know that it's everyone's favorite dinosaur i would it's love a to classic say, it's a classic for a reason <laughs> Right. Uh, Rex was the largest land predator that ever lived. Um, so it was about the size of the weight of an 18 wheeler. Um, it had about 60 teeth, somewhere as long as bananas. Its jaw was so big that you, an adult human, could have fit inside. Uh, it could not chew its food. So it ate by ripping off chunks, throwing them in the air, 
and letting them fall down its throat. Um, and, like uh, popcorn. Yes, like popcorn. Exactly. <laughs> and you would have been a piece of popcorn to a T-Rex. And if it's not scary enough to think about one T-Rex, um, some scientists now think that it's likely that T-Rex hunted in packs like modern day wolves. Um, I can't think of anything scarier than a pack of T-Rexes. So uh, that's that's got to be my favorite dinosaur. But there are a ton of species that just don't get the recognition that they deserve because a lot of them are newly discovered is a big reason. Um, one of my favorites is Therizinosaurus. Um, this was a perhaps the weirdest looking dinosaur that ever lived. So imagine a dinosaur a little bit smaller than T-Rex, about 33 feet long. So big, big dinosaur. Um, also on two legs like T-Rex, but it had a very long, thin neck like a giraffe's. Mm -hmm. It had a bulging pot belly and it had these enormous, absolutely enormous claws on its front limbs. Um, three on each front limb. They were as long as baseball bats. And that makes them the longest claws that we know of, of any animal that ever lived in the history of Earth. Um, they were so big, it's possible that this dinosaur would have walked with its claws sort of dangling, perhaps dragging on the ground. They were so long and heavy. Um, and it's just, I love thinking about this huge dinosaur with its long neck and its big belly dragging its claws around. Um, it was truly bizarre. Mm, wow, it sounds so amazing. And all right, so finally, what's what's next for you? What are you working on? Um, I've got some new books coming up. Um, you know, I can't talk about them specifically until they are published. But yeah, I've always got a uh, new stuff. And um, I've gotten the chance to do a couple of dinosaur books in the last two years, which is really fun. Um, because that was a new topic for me. And now I'm just a dinosaur super fan. And I'm always reading the news coming out about newest dinosaur discoveries. Um, I just think, you know, there's pretty much nothing cooler in science. Absolutely. Very, very cool. Well, thanks for being on the show again, Stephanie. Always a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks for having me. And that was Stephanie Warren Trimmer, author of her new book, Jurassic Smarts. Now out from Nat Geo Kids. Okay, so what about the behaviors of dinosaurs? Now, this is where things get a bit trickier. Paleontologists often look at modern animals with similar features to make educated guesses about behavior. For instance, if a dinosaur had sharp teeth and claws, it could have been a predator. Nesting sites can give us clues about their parenting behavior. Sometimes we get extraordinary fossils called trace fossils. These include footprints, nests, or even coprolites. Fossilized poop. They can tell us a lot about a dinosaur's diet, its gait, and how it may have interacted with its environment. Now, it's important to remember that while these methods provide valuable insights into dinosaur life, there's still much we don't know about these, these creatures. Our understanding is constantly evolving as new discoveries are being made. So the next time you see a depiction of a dinosaur, remember the incredible detective work that went into bringing these magnificent animals back to life using the tools of science. Next week on the Cosmic Companion, we learn why Greece is the word. Talking about the birth of science in the ancient world, we'll be joined by Kenny Curtis and Julian Hughes, hosts of the Greeking Out podcast. We'll discuss their new book of the same name, plus mythology, culture, and the earliest days of Western civilization. Did I mention that a father daughter pair? I think I did. Make sure to join us starting on the 7th of October, which is also Cephalopod Awareness Day. So invite a squid, octopus, or nautilus to watch the show with you on the couch while you cuddle fish. 
This is the part of the show where I ask you to subscribe, follow, share, all that hellabaloo. You know what I'm going to say, right? But I know you are already subscribed to the show on all your favorite social networks because viewers and listeners of the Cosmic Companion are just smart that way. You are smart enough to have subscribed or followed already, right? 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 Mm-hmm. Thought so. Clear skies. <laughs>